Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Cut Rate Commander, the series in which we take a look at low price commanders and make budget decks with them. My name is Grazit and today we'll be taking a look at the legendary mage, Garth One-Eye. Before we continue, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you like this content and would like me to continue making more videos like this in the future. Also, be sure to stick around until the end of the video to see what commanders you can vote for in the comments for an upcoming episode. So with that out of the way, let's start by taking a look at the commander and playstyle. Garth One-Eye is a 5-5 human wizard that costs Wuburg to cast and has the following ability. Tap, choose a name that has not been chosen from among Disenchant, Brain Geyser, Terror, Shiv and Dragon, Regrowth, and Black Lotus. Create a copy of the card of the chosen name. You may cast that copy. You still pay its cost. So Garth is a 5 color commander with a pretty good stat line and an interesting tap ability that gives us additional resources throughout the course of the game. Going down the list of cards that Garth can create, Disenchant costs 1 in a white and destroys an artifact or enchantment, Brain Geyser costs X and double blue and has target player draw X cards, Terror costs 1 in a black and destroys target non-artifact non-black creature and prevents it from regenerating, Shiv and Dragon costs 4 and double red for a 5-5 flyer that we can pay a red to give plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn, Regrowth costs 1 in a green and returns a card from our grave back to hand, and finally, Black Lotus costs 0 and can be tapped and sacked to generate 3 mana of a single color. This makes Garth a source of removal, ramp, card draw, and even creature creation all on his own, with the caveat that he cannot pick the same card again so long as he remains on the field. However, this limitation is not as restrictive as it first may seem, since if Garth is blinked, bounced back to hand, cloned, or even killed and recast, he will be reset to his full complement of cards and be able to produce them again. Not only that, but due to the wording on his card, casting any of the cards that he creates ignores timing restrictions, allowing us to cast any non-instant cards he creates at instant speed. Considering all the utility he provides, Garth can be taken in a number of different directions as far as builds are concerned. Builds that are geared towards using and abusing Garth's ability over and over again would certainly be viable, running plenty of ways to blink Garth and double up on his activation triggers. Five color good stuff would be an effective, albeit pricey way to build him as well, taking advantage of the generic utility Garth provides to run powerful cards that can be supported by them. But in the end, the build that I settled on this time around was a legendary tribal one, leaning more into Garth's lore as a legendary mage and the generic utility he provides to create a deck that would match it. That means we'll be running plenty of legendary creatures in this build, each with powerful abilities of their own, ranging from powerful utility to help us, potent disruption to hamper our opponents, or just raw power to bring our opponents low. But we won't only be dealing with legendary creatures, as legendary spells and legendary artifacts will allow us to bring their powerful effects against our opponents as well. By combining these legends along with the powerful cards that Garth creates for us, we'll be able to drown our opponents in a torrent of powerful effect after powerful effect until they can no longer stand against it. In order to support this playstyle, we'll be running a plethora of ways to grant haste to our creatures, allowing us not only to bring Garth online as soon as we play him, but enabling our more combat-focused legends to swing in immediately as well. Additionally, we'll be running plenty of cards that take advantage of our legendary spells, ranging from card advantage, tutors, and even pump effects to have our legends grow even bigger. Finally, we need to make sure that our legends stick around through our opponents' attempts to cut their story short, so we'll be running a number of ways to make sure they stick around, from protection effects, recursion, and even reanimation, making sure that their legacy endures. So let's assemble a League of Legends all our own, and show our opponents that legends never truly die. So now that we know a bit more about the commander and playstyle, let's start by taking a look at the deck itself by starting with the creatures. Evidently, the CMC 1 slot is no place for legends, so we'll be skipping right to the CMC 2 slot and lead off with Neambi Esteemed Speaker, Zimone Quandrix Prodigy, and Gretchen Thitchwillow. Neambi is a 2-1 with flash that, when she ETBs, gives us the option to return one of our creatures back to hand and gain life equal to its CMC. Additionally, she lets us pay 1, a white, a blue, and tapper to discard a legendary card to draw 2, giving us a low mana way to reset our commander by bouncing him to hand and a way to turn legendary bricks in the early game into card advantage. Zimone is a 1-2 that we can pay 1 and tap to put a land into play tapped from our hand, or 4 and tap to draw a card, or 2 cards instead if we control 8 or more lands, making her the Simicius Simic whoever did Simic by providing both land ramp and card advantage, both effects which will help us immensely. Gretchen is a 0-4 that we can pay 2, a green, and a blue to draw a card and put a land from our hand into play, combining both of Zimone's effects and not tapping itself but trading off the ability to ramp us early to do so, making it more of a later game draw piece with incidental ramp if we have lands in hand. 
Then last in this slot, we have Safi Eric's Daughter, a 2-2 that we can sack to return a creature back to the field if it were to die this turn, giving us some excellent protection and another way to reset Garth in case of his untimely demise. The CMC3 slot is up next, starting with Raiki, the History of Kamigawa, Sisei, Weatherlight Captain, and General Ferris Rockrick. Reiki is a 1-2 that draws us a card whenever we play a Legendary, making it the perfect means for us to generate card advantage as we drop Legend after Legend each turn. Sisei is a 2-2 who gains plus 1 plus 1 for each color among the Legendary permanents we control, and who we can pay Wuberg and Tap to put any Legendary from our deck onto the field whose CMC is equal to or less than Sisei's power, easily becoming a 7-7 next to our commander and allowing us to tutor any Legendary from our deck directly into play for a near-perfect Legendary tutor. General Ferris is a 3-1 with Hexproof from Monocolored and creates a 4-4 whenever we play a multicolored spell, making him quite resilient against many staple removal options and growing our board significantly with his tokens considering the volume of multicolored spells we're running. The middle of this slot then brings us Kurinos, Hound of Athreos, Linvala, Shield of Seagate, and Rada, Heart of Keld. Kurinos is a 3-3 with Vigilance, Menace, and Lifelink that prevents creatures and spells from entering or being cast from the grave, making it a powerful silver bullet against graveyard-heavy strategies on a decently statted body with many relevant keywords. Linvala is a 3-3 flyer who, at the beginning of our combat phase, if we have a full party, has target non-land permanent we choose, be unable to attack or block, and loses all abilities until our next turn. Additionally, we can sack her to give all our creatures either hexproof or indestructible until end of turn, giving us some powerful protection against wipes and target removal, with some disruption added as a bonus, which we have the party members to get to. Rada is a 3-3 that has first strike so long as it's our turn, lets us look at the top card of our deck at any time and play lands from it, and allows us to pay for a green and a red to pump her by plus x plus x, x being equal to the amount of lands we control, ticking multiple boxes as both a source of getting lands into play and an attacker we can pump massively at instant speed. Reaching the end of this slot, we have Rona, Disciple of Gex, Anafenza, the Foremost, and Kethis, the Hidden Hand. Rona is a 2-2 that gives us the option to exile a historic card from our grave when it ETBs and lets us cast non-land cards that have been exiled by her, also allowing us to pay for and tap her to exile the top card of our library, giving us some recursion from our bin as well as pseudo card draw with her ability. Anafenza is a 4-4 that puts a plus one plus one counter on another tapped creature when it attacks and exiles our opponent's creatures when they go to the graveyard from anywhere, wearing multiple hats as a well-statted attacker that pumps others when it swings in, as well as a potent form of graveyard hate that doesn't affect us. Kethis is a 3-4 that reduces the cost of all our legendary spells by one and allows us to exile two legendary spells from our grave to allow us to cast any legendary spells currently in our graveyard until the end of the turn, making him a potent piece of cost reduction and recursion for our legendaries. The CMC4 slot is up next with Audric, Lunark Marshal, Gonti, Lord of Luxury, and Kolvori, God of Kinship. Audric is a 3-3 that, at the beginning of each combat, gives all our creatures a keyword from a list of 13 separate keywords so long as one creature we control already has said keyword, providing us with a way to spread potent keywords to our other legends such as Flying, Haste, and Lifelink to power them up even further. Gonti is a 2-3 Death Toucher that, when it ETBs, has us look at the top 4 cards of target opponent's library, exiling one and putting the rest at the bottom of their deck in a random order allowing us to cast the Exiled card and spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast it, sporting a decent defensive body whose ETB lasts even after they leave play for some extra card advantage from our opponent's decks. Kolvori is a modal DFC whose back faces a mana rock that costs one and a green that has us choose a creature type when it ETBs, tapping for a green which we can only use to pay for that creature type or for legendary creature spells. Then her front face is a 2-4 god who gains plus 4 plus 2 if we control 3 or more legendary creatures, and we can pay 1 a green and tapper to look at the top 6 cards of our deck, revealing a legendary creature from among them to add to our hand, and sending the rest to the bottom of our deck in a random order, making her a source of green mana in the early game if we need it, or a powerful body with the means to dig through our deck for more legends as the game goes on. Going deeper into this slot, we have Brago King Eternal, Chainer Nightmare Adept, and Etrada the Silencer. Brago is a 2-4 flyer that, when it deals combat damage to a player, exiles any number of non-land permanents we control and then returns them back into play under their owner's control, making him another way to reset our commander and even granting all our other creatures pseudo-vigilance as they come back into play untapped. Chainer is a 3-2 which allows us to, once per turn, discard a card to allow us to cast a creature spell from our grave in addition to granting haste to any creature that was cast from outside our hand, providing us with another way to recur our legends and granting our commander haste if he's cast from the command zone to use his ability immediately. 
Hitrada is a 3-5 that cannot be blocked and, when she deals combat damage to a player, exiles one of their creatures with a hit counter on it, which causes said player to lose the game if they ever have three or more of them, and then shuffles herself back into the deck, making her a decent piece of removal that takes advantage of our haste enablers and offers us an alternate win condition when working in conjunction with our tutors. Moving further into this slot, we have some crew members with Gerard Weatherlight Hero, Joyra Weatherlight Captain, and Roth Kapishan Ship's Mage. Gerard is a 3-3 with First Strike that, when he dies, allows us to exile him in order to return all creatures and artifacts from our grave back to the field that died that same turn, giving us some potent board wipe protection for our creature-heavy playstyle. Joyra is another 3-3, this time allowing us to draw a card whenever we cast a historic spell, like Reiki before her, granting us card advantage as we cast our legends, but also proccing off vanilla artifacts as well. Raph is yet another 3-3, this time with Flash and Flying, who allows us to cast historic spells as though they had Flash, giving us a huge amount of flexibility by allowing us to cast our legends on our opponent's turns. Reaching the end of this slot, we have Guillaume Master Chef and Marchesa the Black Rose. Guillaume is a 5-3 Trampler that, on our end step, creates food tokens equal to the amount of non-token creatures we had ETB that turn, while additionally allowing us to pay one and sack a food to make target creature indestructible and tapping it, providing us with another potent source of protection by making our legends very resilient against most of our opponent's removal options. Marchesa is a 3-3 with Dethrone that grants all our other creatures Dethrone as well, in addition to returning any creature with a plus one plus one counter we control back to the field when it dies on the next end step, providing our legends with some potent support by granting them the ability to get plus one plus one counters by attacking the player with the most life, and being able to bring them back upon death, including herself, if they are able to trigger this ability even once. The CMC 5 slot is up next with Kenrith the Returned King, Jengatha the Wellspring, and Arvad the Cursed. Kenrith is a 5-5 with the following abilities. For a red, we can grant all creatures trample and haste until end of turn. For one and a green, we can give target creature a plus one plus one counter. For two and a white, we can grant target player five life. For three and a blue, we can have target player draw a card. And for four and a black, we can put a creature from any graveyard back into play under its owner's control giving us a Swiss Army Knife of powerful effects, making him a potent mana sink for us in the mid to late game to help us grind out our opponents. Jengatha is another 5-5 that we can tap to produce Wooburg and which we cannot use to pay for generic mana costs, giving us a big body that allows us to single-handedly pay for our commander and provide us a huge amount of mana when we need to use it to help cast our multicolored spells. Arvad is a 3-3 with Death Touch and Lifelink that gives all our other legends plus 2 plus 2, making him a decent legendary lord with some relevant keywords. Moving further into this slot, we have some flyers with Dromoka the Eternal, Colligan the Storm's Fury, and Zara Renegade Recruiter. Dromoka is a 5-5 that, whenever a dragon attacks, bolsters too, proccing when it attacks to give our legend with the lowest toughness two plus one plus one counters, and granting our handful of other dragons the same ability, making even utility legends threats as they grow bigger and bigger as we continue to swing in. Colligan is a 4-5 flyer that, whenever a dragon attacks, grants all our creatures plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn, and can be cast for its dash cost of 3, a black and a red, giving us a battle cry effect that also affects itself and she shares with her legendary dragon kin to pump the field even further, even giving us the option to bring her in with haste by paying her dash cost if we have no haste enablers on board at the cost of bringing her back to hand on our end step if we absolutely need the extra reach. Zara is a 4-3 flyer that, when she attacks, has us look at the defending player's hand and allows us to put a creature card from it into play under our control, tapped and attacking said player or planeswalker they control, returning the creature back to its owner's hand at the beginning of the next end step, giving us an evasive body that at worst can give us information and at best nab a potent ETB effect or attack trigger for ourselves for a turn. Closing out this slot, we have some legendary human warriors with Garna the Blood Flame and Samut Voice of Descent. Garna is a 3-3 with Flash that, when she ETBs, returns all creatures that were put into our graveyard that turn back into our hand, as well as granting all our other creatures haste, giving us yet even more protection against wipes and providing more AoE haste to support Garth and our offensive legends. Samut is a 3-4 that also has Flash, in addition to Double Strike Vigilance and Haste, who can also grant all our other creatures haste and we can pay a white and tap to untap another target creature, making her a powerhouse with a host of keywords, an AoE haste effect, and even allowing her to untap Garth to use him twice in a turn, making her an invaluable asset for our build. Finally reaching the CMC 6 slot, we have our last three legends with Itali Primal Storm, Zagreus Thief of Heartbeats, and Amrith the Lustrous. 
Itali is a 6-6 that exiles the top card of each player's deck when it attacks, allowing us to cast any spells exiled this way for free, working very nicely with our haste enablers to overcome its biggest downside of being slow for potentially up to 4 free spells every time it attacks. Zagreus is a 4-4 with flying death touch and haste that costs one less for each member of the party we control, grants all our creatures death touch, and has any planeswalker that has dealt damage by our creatures be destroyed giving himself some nice cost reduction if we can assemble a few party members on our field, granting AoE death touch for some potent keyword distribution, and granting the ability to deal with pesky planeswalkers as a bonus. Amarith is a 6-6 flyer that, whenever another permanent enters the battlefield under our control, lets us look at the top card of our library and put that card into our hand if it shares a type with it, making it a good source of card draw for us due to our high creature count and even counting our lands as we make our land drops per turn. That covers all our creatures, so let's move on to our instance. Skipping to the CMC2 slot, we have a trio of removal spells with Despark, Fracture, and Terminate. Despark exiles any permanent of CMC4 or greater, making it a potent exile-based removal source for higher CMC threats. Fracture destroys an artifact, enchantment, or planeswalker, giving us a flexible back row removal tool to deal with a variety of threats. Terminate destroys a creature and it can't be regenerated, providing us with some no-nonsense creature removal with upside against regenerators as a small bonus. Last in this slot, we're running Golgari Charm, which has us either give all creatures minus one minus one until end of turn, destroy an enchantment, or regenerate each creature we control, which we're mostly playing for the board-wide regeneration, but whose other modes give us some additional flexibility. Reaching the CMC3 slot, we have our last trio of instants with Beast Within, Mythos of Nethroi, and Putrefy. Beast Within destroys any permanent at the cost of giving its controller a 3-3, making it a potent removal tool to deal with almost any type of threat with only a minor downside. Mythos of Nethroi destroys a creature, or instead a non-land permanent if we use a green and a white to pay for its mana cost, giving us another powerful removal spell that deals with a variety of threats, which we should usually be able to cast for its permanent removal cost with no issue. Putrefy destroys an artifact or creature and prevents it from being regenerated, making it another tool to deal with common threats while having the additional upside against regenerators if we run across them. That's all our instants covered, so let's move on to our sorceries. Skipping to the CMC2 slot, we have a trio of spells with Rampant Growth, Time of Need, and Kamal's Druidic Vow. Rampant Growth lets us search our deck for a basic land and put it into play tapped, giving us some staple green land ramp to fix our greedy mana base. Time of Need has us search our deck for a legendary creature and add it to our hand, making it a potent tutor to search up any of our creatures whenever we may need them. Kamal's Druidic Vow is a legendary X spell that has us look at the top X cards of our library, allowing us to put any lands or legendary permanents with CMC X or less into play and sending the rest to our grave. Its legendary claws being easily fulfilled thanks to the high volume of legendary creatures we run and providing us with a huge amount of ramp and free spells if we can get X up to between 4 and 6. Moving to the CMC3 slot, we have another trio of members with Cultivate, Kodama's Reach, and Search for Glory. Cultivate and Kodama's Reach both search our deck for two basic lands, putting one into play tapped and the other into our hand for some more staple green land ramp to get all our colors into play faster. Search for Glory has a search our deck for any legendary, snow permanent, or saga and puts it into our hand, making it an even better tutor than Time of Need by searching any legendary card, including legendary sorceries and artifacts, for even more flexibility. Skipping to the CMC5 slot, we have a single entry with Urza's Ruinous Blast, a legendary sorcery that exiles all non-land, non-legendary permanents, giving us an extremely powerful wipe that leaves our board virtually untouched while devastating our opponent's front and back row with some potent exile-based removal. Skipping again to the CMC7 slot, we have our last sorcery with Primeval's Glorious Rebirth, a legendary sorcery that returns all our legendary permanents from the grave to the field giving us a mass reanimation spell that again not only affects our creatures but all our legendary permanents to help us recover our board states in the late game. That covers all our sorceries, so let's move on to our enchantments. The CMC1 slot brings us Font of Fertility, which we can pay 1, a green, and sack to put a basic land from our deck into play tapped, giving us some more land-based ramp to help us get to all our colors quickly. The CMC2 slot then gives us the Bard class, which at level 1 has all our legendaries ETB with an extra plus 1 plus 1 counter, it's level 2 reducing the cost of all legendary spells by a green and a red, and it's level 3 exiling the top 2 cards of our deck whenever we cast a legendary spell, allowing us to cast those cards until end of turn, providing us a stacked suite of abilities that benefit our legendary focused playstyle. Reaching the CMC3 slot, we have our last two enchantments with Fires of Yavimaya and Teamer Ascendancy. 
Both grant all our creatures haste, the former allowing us to sack it to grant a creature plus two plus two until end of turn, while the latter draws us a card whenever a creature of power four plus ETBs under our control, making them both good haste enablers with upside to enable our aggressive playstyle. That covers all our enchantments, so let's move on to our artifacts. Starting us off in the CMC1 slot, we have Soul Ring, which taps for two colorless and we're running because we're playing Commander and it provides a ridiculous amount of ramp for us in the early game. We'll also be running Instrument of the Bards in this slot, a legendary artifact that allows us to put a harmony counter on it on each of our upkeeps and we can tap for three and a green to search our library for a creature with CMC equal to the number of harmony counters on it and put it into our hand, creating a treasure if it was a legendary creature, giving us a repeatable tutor that even ramps us as the game progresses. Moving into the CMC2 slot, we have Arcane Signet, which taps for any color in our commander's color identity for a powerful colored mana ramp source, and Swiftfoot Boots, an equipment that equips for one and gives the equipped creature hexproof in haste, making it a good haste enabler and source of protection for our commander or other creatures. The CMC3 slot then gives us Commander Sphere, which also taps for any color in our commander's color identity and we can sack to draw a card, giving us another mana rock that's capable of tapping for any of our colors that we can turn into card advantage if we need to. A pair of legendary artifacts join us in the CMC4 slot with Dragon Throne of Tarkir and Thran Temporal Gateway. Dragon Throne of Tarkir is a legendary equipment that equips for 3, grants the equipped creature Defender, and we can pay 2 and tap the equipped creature to give all our other creatures Trample and plus X plus X until end of turn, X being equal to the equipped creature's power, giving us a very powerful board wipe pump depending on who we have seated on that throne for that extra reach. Thran Temporal Gateway is a legendary artifact which we can pay for and tap to put a historic permanent from our hand into play, allowing us to cheat on mana cost for some of our more expensive legends as well as cast them at flash speed for extra flexibility. Finally reaching the CMC5 slot, we have our last artifact with Hero's Podium, a legendary artifact that pumps all our legendary creatures by plus one plus one for each other legendary creature we control, and we can pay X and tap to look at the top X cards of our deck and put a legendary creature from among them into our hand, sending the rest to the bottom of the deck in a random order, providing us with a huge anthem on stacked board states along with a way to search for even more legendary creatures to pump the board state even further. That covers all our artifacts, so let's move on to our Planeswalkers. Our only Planeswalker joins us in the CMC4 slot, that being Samut's Tyrant Smasher, who comes into play with 5 loyalty, grants all our creatures haste, and her minus 1 grants target creature plus 2 plus 1 in haste until end of turn as well as scrying 1, making her another haste enabler that can pump our creatures even further with some added card selection tacked on as a bonus. That's it for our Planeswalkers, so let's move on to our land base. It's mana lands all the way down this time, starting with Command Tower, which taps for any color in our commander's color identity, Exotic Orchard, which taps for any color an opponent's land would be able to produce, Thriving Bluff, Thriving Grove, Thriving Heath, Thriving Isle, and Thriving Moor, all of which come into play tapped and have us select a color when they ETB, able to tap for their own or the selected color, Crumbling Necropolis, Frontier Bovac, Jungle Shrine, Mystic Monastery, Nomad Outpost, Opulent Palace, and Sand Steep Citadel, all of which come into play tapped and tap for one out of three of our colors, and finally Evolving Wilds and Terramorphic Expanse, both of which we can tap and sack to put a basic land from our deck into play tapped. Lastly, we're running four plains, four islands, four swamps, four mountains, and four forests as our basics to fill out our land slots. So now that we've covered all the cards in the deck, let's take a look at this deck's breakdown. This deck currently has 35 creatures including the commander, 7 instants, 8 sorceries, 4 enchantments, 8 artifacts, 1 planeswalker, and 36 lands. Looking at the stats that matter to our game plan, we have 44 legendary spells, 15 cards that care about legendaries, 8 cards that enable haste, 5 cards that can reanimate our creatures, 5 cards that can recur spells back to hand or allow them to be cast again from the grave, and 3 spells that protect our creatures while they're on the board, giving us a huge amount of legendary spells and payoffs to take advantage of them, while running plenty of ways to enable our legends to tap for their abilities or attack immediately when summoned, as well as ways to make sure that they stay on the field or come back to it if they're ever removed. For general deck stats, we have 15 ramp sources, 11 card draw sources, 10 targeted removal sources, and 1 board wipe. Running a low amount of wipes in this build due to our heavy creature base, but running the standard amount of ramp, draw, and targeted removal. Looking at our mana curve, we have 3 1 drops, 13 2 drops, 18 3 drops, 14 4 drops, 11 5 drops, 
three six drops, and one seven drop, giving us a mid to late game curve focused on getting our ramp and utility legends out early and dropping powerful legendary bodies and spells once we've sorted our mana base out. Currently, this deck is valued at 65.20, not counting the price of basic lands or shipping. This price was calculated by using the cheapest listed marketplace price on TCG Player at the time of this recording. For some side grades, some non-legendary creatures can be considered to support this playstyle. Thalia's Lancers, for example, make a decent tutor to search up even non-creature legendaries, while Joyra's Familiar is another source of cost reduction to make our legends and even our non-legendary artifacts cheaper. Finally, Faeborrow Elder is a great source of ramp that gets huge thanks to our 5-color deck. Weatherlight would also be a good addition, helping us dig deeper into our deck for even more legendaries or artifacts whenever it deals combat damage for even more card advantage. More legendary creatures would also warrant consideration, such as Midomai the Ageless, which benefits greatly from our haste enablers to grant an extra turn when they connect, Rubina Soulsinger, who also benefits from haste to immediately steal an opponent's creature when she ETBs, and finally Chalet Voice of Plenty gives us some potent protection with her board-wide hexproof and the ability to grow our board even further. For upgrades, the first thing we should consider is a land base to help increase our deck's speed. Shock lands would be a great addition to help quicken up the deck by giving us the option to have them come into play untapped, while the triomes would be a good fit by being easier to search and having cycling to cantrip them away if we don't need them as a bonus. Once that's been sorted, Najila the Blade Blossom is a good addition for the extra combat phase she provides, as well as the additional 1-1s she can produce alongside our other warriors. Hammer of Nazan is a searchable legendary that makes a creature very resilient thanks to granting it indestructibility while pumping it slightly. Dryad of the Elysian Grove gives us some superb ramp and fixing for our greedy mana base. And Captain Sisse is a repeatable tutor that searches up all our legends at no mana cost. And depending on how deep our pockets go, additional tutors would also be viable. Demonic Tutor, for example, being a good way to bring anything from our deck to hand, while Vampiric Tutor costing only a single mana and two life to put that card on top of our deck. An effect we can double up on by playing Imperial Seal as a functional reprint to double up on the effect at nearly 14 times the price. What a bargain. Thanks everyone for sticking around until the end of the video. Another round of thanks to my subscribers is in order, as the channel has reached its 750 sub milestone and is three-fourths of the way to that 1k mark and monetization. Thank you all again for supporting the channel, as none of this would be possible without all of your support. Moving on to the votes, it looks like Helene Reclusive Painter has taken this one in a landslide, as voted by Adam Kaiser, Bobsley, Chubby Grunt 90, Daedalin, Dorito Dust 007, Federico Nastasi, IC3 Fire 21, IT Guy Rob, Kisari, One Trick of Fanny, The Line Guy, and Yakmiaria. Moving on to the voting, we'll be shaking up the candidates with a fresh batch from AFR, this time featuring Trillasara Moondancer, Gretchen Thitchwillow, and Tognar Demonfang Knoll. Let me know in the comments below which of these three you'd like to see an upcoming video on. And with that, have a good one folks, and stay safe.